Hello and welcome to MTG Deck Tech. Today we're going to take a look at uh, one of uh, the best decks in the format right now. Probably the best deck in the format and my personal version of it. It's uh, the Saltai Food Deck. So this is one of uh, the deck deep dives I'm doing from time to time where I talk about every single card in the deck and what it can do and uh, how it interacts with the rest of the deck. Um, this time I'm going to talk about the sideboard as well as I've started playing best of three matches and uh, had a lot of success with this deck. Uh, so the main point of this deck is uh, Oko. Oko is pretty broken in case you have been living on a, under a rock and uh, didn't notice. Um, Oko is a very busted card. I'm going to talk about him a little bit later. But it all starts off with the Gilded Goose. Gilded Goose is your preferred turn one play. So if you play the Gilded Goose you make a food token. Also, you can sacrifice this food token to get mana to get Oko down on uh, turn two. But, and you can also create uh, even more food tokens by play paying two mana. So Gilded Goose is a very nice way of having a continuous uh, source of food. And you will need the food uh, for your questing, uh, for your Wicked Wolves, uh, for your Oko to do stuff with for Vraska. And uh, yeah, it's just a very nice card overall. Gives you a mana ramp, gives you a um, life game with the foods, and yeah, it's all around one of the best cards in the format. Speaking of one of the best cards in the format, uh, Once Upon a Time, uh, it's a card that can get you creatures and also lands. Um, I only have three in the deck, uh, you could probably uh, play four if you found something to take out. I didn't find it yet, uh, but I'm searching for it because Once Upon a Time is uh, one of the best cards in the format, uh, as well as the Gilded Goose was because you can play it for free if it's your first spell. So you want to have it in your opening hand. It's uh, not that great if you draw it later, but it's still a good card. It can draw you the lands you need, it can draw you uh, good creatures. And yeah, it's just overall a very, very nice card to have in your deck and gives you the early game power you need to get your Oko down on turn two, which is what you want to do almost any time. Um, so if I don't have uh, like the Paradise Druid or the Goose uh, in the first two turns, probably gonna mulligan that. Uh, if I have a once upon a time I might keep it because I can get both of these creatures um, but I really want to get the ramp going. So Paradise Druid is just some um, mana dog. It makes you, uh, to, uh, makes you a mana of any color which is important because you have three colors in your deck and you need some blue mana, you need some black mana. So that will help you with all of that. And it also has hexproof as long as it's untapped. So if you don't use it, your opponent won't be able to destroy it that easily, only with board wipes and stuff like that. So that's a very nice card to have, uh, giving you mana, fixing your mana cost and um, doing good stuff for you. Murderous Rider is just an overall nice creature. It has uh, the ability to destroy target uh, creatures or planeswalkers uh, for the cost of two life. You can use it and after that you can play it as a creature that has lifelink. Um, and won't go to your graveyard, which isn't important for this deck because you won't get stuff out of the graveyard. Um, it's overall just a very nice card to have um, as a removal spell. I um, valued it over Noxious Grafts, uh, which I show you here. I have only in the sideboard. And many people are playing Noxious Grasp in the main board to get rid of your, the, your opponent's Oko because Oko has been so format breaking. Um, but I myself don't like dead cards and Murderous Rider is almost never a dead card. Uh, if your opponent plays Esper Dance, maybe it may be a dead card, but even then you can play it on Teferi and stuff like that. So it's always a nice card to have. It has lifelink, so it get, gets the life back that it costs. And yeah, it's overall a very, very nice card. So Oko is, uh, as I said, the format breaking uh, Planeswalker. It starts at 4 loyalty and it can immediately go, go up to 6 with uh, creating a food token. It can also turn stuff into elks. You might have seen the memes, everything is a free free elk now. You can turn everything into elks, you can turn your opponent's witch's oven into elks, it can't do anything anymore. You can turn your opponent's giant creature into an elk, it can't do anything anymore. So yeah, that's a very nice card to have. You can also get cards from your opponent. Uh, if you switch it, for example, with the food token, you can make your food token in uh, the first turn you play Oko and next turn you can just swap it over for a creature that has power three or less. So um, Oko is very versatile. You will have to learn how to play with him. You have to learn all the interactions. For example, 
if you uh, elk another creature, it becomes a green creature. So you can noxious grasp it away uh, if you sideboard that in. And um, those are some of the tricks you can do. You can also, um, for example, you can um, you can elk your own thing uh, to make it bigger in, in case you want more uh, power to do. You can elk your own food to make it into a creature and have board presence. And you can also um, elk yeah, everything your opponent has, but you have to watch out um, because counters your opponent has are still transferred on the elk. So, for example, if your opponent played a big hideout crisis, you will be able to elk it to get uh, rid of its flying ability and its trample, but you will have all the counters and you will also have hydroid crisis be a free free. So you're making it free free bigger, which you can of course also do on your own hydroid crisis in case you need some more punching power. Um, but you have to watch out for that in your opponent's crisis. You can uh, make the stuff uh, bigger than it would ever have been. Uh, Questing Beast is a card that has fallen a bit out of favor because um, Oko can just make it into an elk, um, which is of course true for every creature that hasn't hexproof, hasn't got hexproof. Um, but the Questing Beast, I think, is still a very nice card to get rid of Planeswalkers uh, because. It cannot be blocked by uh, small creatures with power two or less, and it also deals the damage it does to your opponent to your opponent's planeswalker you choose. So, also vigilant death, death touch and haste is just very nice. You can always get value with it when you play it on the turn, and yeah, your opponent has to oko it the next turn, but uh, before that you get some value out of it. Um, this is a card I sideboard out when I play against okos. But otherwise, I mostly keep it in, especially if your opponent has uh, small creatures or stuff you want to destroy with the de death touch. Uh, you will definitely have room for your questing beast in the deck. Next, we have the Wicked Wolf, which is uh, one of your best food payoffs. Um, it uh, fights another creature when it enters the battlefield and you can also sacrifice a food to put a plus one plus one counter on it and make it indestructible until the end of turn. Uh, you have to tap it when you do that, but uh, most of the times you're going to um, fight uh, some 4-4 creature or something and put a counter on it when it gets into the battlefield and then you just win the fight and your uh, Wicked Wolf stays, stays alive. So Wicked Wolf can do a lot of things. You can uh, keep it alive for long um, if you have enough food. So if your Oko makes food, you keep the Wicked Wolf alive uh, for very long. It's almost impossible to kill. Uh, unless your opponent has an exile or something and or it can get rid of the, your food so with the wicked wolf you always want to keep at least one food laying around you might need more in case you want to block something really big or something um, but yeah that's the rule of thumb keep your stuff around keep your food around for the wicked wolf make no, fo no new foods with oko and yeah feed them to your wolf next card is raska gogari queen which is also a very versatile card um, this is a card that can do a lot of things. You can sacrifice something like a food token to gain one life and draw a card. You can also destroy a non-land permanent with a CMC free or less, which means you can destroy Oko with it. You can destroy Witch's Oven with it. You can destroy so many things with it that are in the meta right now. And yeah, so Raska is a very nice card to have and um, to work with. You can sideboard her out if, he, if your opponent doesn't have that many free mana th stuff. But yeah, it's a very nice card to have to, um, especially with your Oko that, that's making food and you can sacrifice the food. You can also sacrifice lands if you have too many of those. And you have a lot of options with your Raska. And it's one of the reasons why we play black in this deck. Nissa Who Shakes the World is a card that is very powerful. I don't think I have to say much about it. You can make your lands into free free creatures uh, because you put free 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 counters on it, which means that you could elk the lands to make them six sixes, but then they would lose their vigilance and then they would lose their land status. So you have to think about whether you want to do that. I mostly don't do it. Um, but you also have more mana if you pl tap the forest so you gain an additional green mana every time you tap a forest which is uh, true for your breeding pool and for your overgroom tomb as well so nissa can make a lot of mana that you can spend for example on the hydroid crisis and yeah you can also alt nissa if you get her to eight and make your lands undestructible and mostly just win the game outright next we're going to talk about casualties of war casualties of war is a very nice 
board wipe almost that can destroy so many things of your opponent. Uh, you can destroy an artifact, a creature, enchantment land and planeswalker, not or because you can choose whatever you want. Of course, before casting this card, you have to watch out if your opponent has a uh, an enchantment or an artifact it's not always that clear uh, you have to watch out unless uh, you can destroy your own stuff which uh, yeah can be a very bad thing if you don't watch out what you really want to destroy and um, even if your opponent has a chance to sacrifice some things for example they sacrifice a creature and they don't have any more creatures then of course you will have to destroy your own creature which you don't want to do so you have to watch out what you want to do with casualties of war but it's a very nice card uh, the destroy land cost clause is something I will always uh, click um, because you can just uh, hurt your opponent's mana base. For example, if they don't only have a one red source, you can destroy that. If they have uh, stuff like a castle rantress that can uh, do other things, you can destroy that. So it's a very nice card to have to destroy those things. And um, yeah, that's a card I would want to sideboard out if you play against very aggressive strategies because it does cost six mana. And yeah, that can be a problem. Um, Hydroid Crisis is also one of the strongest c uh, cards uh, ever since it was released in uh, Allegiance. Uh, you can um, pay a green and a blue to and an X amount um, to really get um, power on the battlefield. You also draw half um, the, the life. Uh, you gain half the life of the X and draw half the cards. So you want to uh, play it as a two or a four. Uh, well, if you have only five, then uh, of course you're going to play it as a five, but uh, you would want to at least get to a few points to be able to draw some stuff. Uh, you don't really want to play it at the at the beginning of the game. You would want to play it if you have a Nissa on the battlefield and can make so much mana with the forests and um, yeah, just draw so many cards and your opponent most of the time just uh, scoops your their cards up and gives up. Um, so... Hydroid Crisis is a card that can just get you to the end game, draw you a lot of cards, is a very strong creature by itself and has trample and flying and yeah, what's not to love about Hydroid Crisis? I, I think if you played standard in the last months, you know how strong this card is. So yeah, we're having some, um, the lands, uh, we have at least one of every basic land because we want to get it with the Fable Passage. We only have two Fable Passages because if you don't have four uh, lands in the battlefield, you have to let it tap, um, which is not good, which is uh, something you don't want to do because yeah, you want to be quick, you want to get your quick Oko, you want to get your quick Nissa, and yeah, that just uh, hinders you with that. But otherwise, it's a very nice card. You can fetch uh, one of those bas basic lands and get whatever you need. Um, I also have uh, three types of shock lands for every color that's involved. Um, I don't really have the scry lands or something because I think it's again too slow for this deck But as you can play those cards untapped, it is very nice with uh, the stuff you want to do Okay, let's look at the sideboard. I have one copy of the rest in case my opponent has a great non-land stuff that I want to get out of their hand early. I get the duress. It's very nice on the draw because if you play a black mana on the first turn, you can just duress and get stuff out like an Oko or something. And you also have information on what your opponent is going to do because you know their cards. Second card is a Veil of Summer. A Veil of Summer is a card that protects you against counter spells or against black removal so basically against anything that can hurt you and uh, you want to play four of those if your opponent has a blue or um, a black in the deck and they want to destroy your stuff and you have to keep one green mana uh, so you need one green mana more than you are going to cast for example if you have questing beast and don't want it uh, to be countered you have to have five mana um, and then you can play the Whale of Summer whenever they do stuff. You draw a card, uh, you get hexproof, your spells can't be countered anymore, and all that good stuff. So that's a very nice card against, yeah, Simic Flash or stuff like that, annoying counter spell decks. Legion's End is something you put in against opponents that have uh, very many, very small creatures. You can exile multiple creatures with that, maybe. Uh, but you also get um, information about your opponent's hand and maybe even extra stuff out of that hand. So uh, Legion's End is very nice against like a mono red cavalcade or stuff like that or um, 
some kind of white uh, white weenie which we haven't seen in a while but yeah again stuff like that it's very nice noxious grass i've already talked about people are putting that in the main deck now because they want to get rid of oko and of course you can uh, board it in if you want to get rid of an opponent's oko and it's just a very nice removal sk uh, skill to have in those mirrors Next up I have the Elder Spell against uh, opponents that are going to play a lot of Clanes Walkers, for example Jeskai Walkers deck or something like that. And you can destroy as many Planes Walkers as you want and get a lot of uh, loyalty tokens, for example for your Nissa and Altar or for your Raska Golgari Queen and Altar, um, which of course her ult uh, basically ends the game whenever you damage your opponent, so it's a very strong ult. Uh, yeah, Elder Spell is just great against opponents that have a lot of Planes Walkers. Assassin's Trophy is basically um, the small version of Casualties of War because it can destroy anything but it can only destroy one thing at a time. And um, Assassin's Trophy also allows your opponent to get a basic land onto the battlefield so you want to use it with caution uh, really only if your opponent has enough mana either way and you really need to destroy something uh, you can bring it in against aggressive decks uh, that use uh, some kind of enchantment like a mono red cavalcade or something like that or that have uh, stuff like the experimental frenzy and yeah you can use it to get rid of those co um, of those things uh, also with uh, against the esper dance deck you have a chance to get rid of those enchantments and this is the card for those kind of matchups so mostly I might uh, put one or two casualties out and uh, put in the Assassin's Trophy against aggressive decks. Ashiok, Ashiok is just a card that uh, mills your opponent but also exiles the graveyard. So I play it against anything that wants to have stuff in the graveyard, for example Esper Dance decks. And against those uh, decks uh, Ashiok does a lot of work, uh, otherwise it's uh, really useless. And finally Ritual of Suit. It's basically just a bigger form of Legion's End. It can destroy all creatures with mana cost 3 or less. And yeah, this can help you against those aggressive decks, uh, decks that play a lot of small creatures. You can just wipe the board. Uh, but you also destroy your own stuff, so you will always have to weigh if it's worth or not. So this is the deck. Uh, it's a very nice deck. I have made a gameplay video on it, uh, so if you want to check that out, you can do it. And yeah, I hope you liked uh, this deck um, overview. I was a bit nervous right now because I have some health problems. I hope it doesn't uh, didn't affect me too much. Um, yeah, but uh, we'll see each other another time. And until then, this was MTG Deck Tech with your freshest deck, your meta deck. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Like the video, subscribe to my channel, and we'll see each other the next time. Until then, see you.